part of the idea that would go back to some of the basic teachings. I remember that I got a question recently about what heaven is like, and I felt that the answer I gave was incomplete. So I wanted to try and address that in a more formal way through the teaching. But um, the reason that I say it's incomplete is because, uh, you know, the first thing uh, that I have to say is that, honestly, we don't know. <laughs> the, the strictest Bible truth about this is we really, we really don't know what heaven is like. We, we don't really have a way of understanding or, or explaining it. It's a different way of being, and that's captured in 1 John chapter 3, um, verses 2 and 3, where John tells us we are beloved. He tells us we are children of God, and that's a great blessing. But he also says, beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be not, um, yeah, we are now God's children, but what we will be has not yet appeared. And that's fairly plain. What is going to be? We don't know what that's like yet. We do know this, that when he appears, we will be like him because we'll see him as he is. So when Jesus returns, which is to say when he appears, We'll be like him, which is not how we are right now. And exactly how that is, is not clear. As he said, what, you know, we are now God's children. When he appears, we will be like him. But what that will be has not yet appeared. It's not clear exactly what that is like. But it is clear that because we know he will appear and we will be like him, that we have a hope. And because of that hope, we purify ourselves. That is, we live a righteous life looking forward to that time, even though we may not understand exactly what it's like. Um, continuing on that same path that it's actually not revealed in Scripture, we do know these other things, which is it isn't like earth, and it's not like earthly relationships. And there are several passages that talk about this and make a, a um, distinction, I guess, between what we know and understand as life and, and uh, the way that we are today versus what it's going to be like. Luke 20 is one of those places uh, where Jesus gets a question about people who have been married many times over, for example, uh, even if it was okay for them to do it. You know, in the resurrection or in the life after death, who's, you know, who's going to be paired up as husband and wife? And the answer is in Luke 20, 34 to 36. Jesus said to them, the sons of this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are considered worthy to attain to that age, to the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage. For they cannot die anymore because they are equal to angels. They're sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. <clears throat> Just saying, when the next age or the next world appears, like what John said, we don't know exactly, but when he appears, we're going to be like him because we'll see him as he is. It's not like what we're doing right now. And in the way that we are given in marriage, we marry and are given in marriage, that's not the way things are there. There, there is no temporal life. There is no till death do us part. There is no death. They're equal to, to angels. They're children of God, children of the resurrection. So it's a different relationship. It's, it's different somehow that we don't quite understand and, and maybe don't need to. Um, in 1 Corinthians 15 is another place that is important to go to, to understand that this body, the earth, is not transferable. <laughs> Non-transferable, as in this body is not going anywhere except, you know, earth. But the question comes to Paul about resurrection from the dead, uh, afterlife, in 1 Corinthians 15, beginning at 35. Someone asked, how are the dead raised? What kind of body do they come with? And he said, it's, it's foolish, because they were arguing with him that there is no resurrection. And that's not what we're saying, I understand. But the illustration holds, which is, what you sow doesn't come to life unless it first dies. 
What you sow isn't the body that is going to be. It's a bare kernel, perhaps wheat or some other grain. True, the seed that you plant looks nothing like the plant that comes up. Whatever seed it is, looks nothing like the plant or the tree, whatever it is that's going to come up as a result of that seed. So it is with our body. We, we don't know what is going to be in the future. What will this turn into after we are buried? <laughs> and this seed that is our life, our body, becomes some other thing, some perhaps dramatic, like mustard seed and a mustard tree, a totally dramatic change, a complete character change in magnitude and glory, something unimaginable from this tiny little seed. But God gives it a body as he's chosen to each kind of seed, its own body. So there's a certain kind of reckoning there that how you live determines how you are resurrected. That's all he's saying. And that's true. Can't live wrong and die right. Nor can you live right and die wrong. God is not mocked. Whatever a person sows is what he reaps. But if you skip down a little bit to the 50th verse, I do tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Perishable meaning something that can decay, like the body. Everything in this world has some kind of perishable quality about it. Right, like food, you bring food home from the grocer, it has a date, best buy, you know, but that's perishable food. It will decay, it will deteriorate in some way such that you don't want to use it anymore, right? That's what he means by this. Flesh and blood doesn't inherit the kingdom of God. The perishable doesn't inherit the imperishable. It's not going to be like here, is all he means. I tell you a mystery. We'll not all sleep but we will all be changed. Now, sleep is a euphemism for dying. Those who die in this world, but are Christians, are asleep in Jesus. They're resting. We may not all sleep, but we will all be changed, which is very consistent with what John said. We don't know what it's going to be yet. We know that when, we, when he appears, we will be like him because we'll see him as he is. There's going to be something different, something changed. It's also consistent with what Jesus said. It's not like here where we have temporal life. Uh, we have the ability to vow until death parts us in marriage. It's not like that. We will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. So how does this happen? It happens instantaneously is what that means. The trumpet will sound. The dead will be raised imperishable. And we will be changed. So the trumpet sounds. Those who have already passed are raised, but not like zombies from the grave. They're raised imperishable. That is, that transformation already happens. And we also are transformed. Now, this is also what he said at 1 Thessalonians 4. And I do want to look at that one. 13 to 17, a little bit longer, but just bear with me on this. It's... Uh, the last bit of it, we don't want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are currently asleep, so that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. Since we believe Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have already fallen asleep. This we declare to you by a word from the Lord. We who are alive, who remain until the coming of the Lord, will not come before those who have already fallen asleep. What he means by this is they haven't died because they were inferior in some way. It's just the passing of time. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. That's what he said at 1 Corinthians 15. Remember, the trumpet sounds, the dead rise. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So always be with the Lord. No indication that Jesus ever returns to earth. No indication that Jesus ever sets up some earthly kingdom. In fact, quite the opposite. 
what happens at that last trumpet is a complete transformation from this physical body into whatever that spiritual thing is that we're not 100% sure about, and that's fine. But that's the way that's going to be, and we join him in the air. Why uh, in the air? Well, because that's where he went when he ascended into heaven. And the angels that stood by even said as much, he's going to come back the way you saw him leave. <clears throat> and the clouds in the air. There's no indication that he's going to come to earth and set foot on earth again. What it says is the trumpet sounds. There's an instantaneous transformation of those who have already fallen asleep and those who may remain alive at the time that the Lord returns. Physical world is over at that point. The next thing, the new thing, what is that like? That's the question that started all of this, and we don't know exactly. We have some things that tell us what it's like. But this is intended to be a comfort that we will always be with the Lord in this way. We also can see in 2 Peter 3, verses 10 through 12, that the current earth, heavens and earth, the skies, if you will, the sky and outer space and this planet will be burned up and dissolved. It's going to be dissolved, that is, disintegrate, atom by atom. <laughs> what sort of people should you be, since you know that everything will be dissolved? And lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for, hastening the coming of the day of God. You know, we, we're looking forward to it, not because we want everything to go up in flame or because we want everything to melt, but because we want to be with the Lord. We want to be in heaven and rejoice. So we come back to it, and like I said, I feel like it's a, it's a kind of a dissatisfying, an unsatisfying answer to say we don't really know, but it's the truth. From Scripture, very little is said about what is heaven like in terms of what's there, what is it like to exist there, what is happening there. That's just not revealed. Um, there are a lot of passages in the Revelation that use kind of symbolic imagery about the throne room and the creatures uh, and all these kinds of things, but those are symbols that are borrowed from the prophets, and they're a picture of heaven as it stands now, not the future state, and uh, they're symbolic. So that doesn't really tell you what heaven is like. And the new Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem, in the end is said to be something that has come down out of heaven. It's not heaven. It came down out of heaven. It's not the same thing. And what came down out of heaven was called a bride adorned for her husband. That's Ephesians 5. It's the church. Uh, the description of it there is a description of the church, not heaven. So it is, you know, in a very strict way, we know very little about it. But there are other things that tell us that we want heaven nonetheless. <laughs> One of these uh, that I would focus on first is that heaven has much better blessings than earth. And there are blessings on earth. <clears throat> we give thanks for our food. We give thanks for times of refreshing, for rain, other things. We give thanks for our families, our children. Sometimes. No, always. <laughs> That's just seeing if anybody's paying attention. That's a joke. We always give thanks for our children. Sometimes give thanks for our parents. But no, we are very glad for these blessings. And there are good things. And, and uh, you know, having a family is not the easiest thing, but I think it is the best. Not the easiest way, but there's a lot of joy in there, too. Uh, and, you know, marriage is the same way. Anything, you know. Anything worth doing is going to be something that's hard to do. <laughs> going to take work. But heaven has better blessings than these. You can see in Matthew 5 that there is a theme of heaven being a better reward, a better treasure than whatever earth has to offer. He said there in Matthew 5, 11 to 12, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. 
how we might think that doesn't sound very fun. I don't like being reviled or persecuted. No, I don't either. It's not fun. He's not saying that. He is saying, if this is because of him on his account, then you are blessed. Rejoice and be glad because your reward is great in heaven. There's something in heaven for you when you are living for God and paying a price for it. You have a reward there and it is great. It's great enough that you rejoice and be glad at this time, even when bad things are happening. That's how much better heaven is than earth. And in the sixth chapter, continuing in the teaching in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus also said in 19, 20 and 21, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy. That's a kind of perishable, by the way. That's a kind of decay, a kind of corruption is uh, rust or corrosion on on uh, metal coins those are the same word in greek but don't lay up treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy where thieves break in and steal lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where no moth or rust destroys where thieves do not break in and steal so that's already better but where your treasure is there your heart will be too so your heart can be in heaven can be set on heaven you have a better reward for suffering here, you have a better treasure there, a better place to store where there is not corrosion, corruption, decay, uh, loss, theft. You know, nobody takes away from you your share in heaven, your, um, you know, God's love for you, God's favor for you when you serve him. Heaven is also a better inheritance than whatever inheritance you have on earth. And sometimes you get some awesome things and sometimes you get a lot of nothing just how it is and nobody asked you know you didn't elect your parents and you know that's just how things are but in heaven is an inheritance that is far greater than any inheritance here third to the fifth verse of first peter this is how he opens up blessed be the god and father of our lord christ according to his great mercy he's caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading. These are all words talking about money that tarnishes or that corrodes. When we say it's imperishable, your inheritance is imperishable, undefiled, unfading. Inheritances do. They tarnish, they corrode. Things happen to money over time. It loses its value. Not so with heaven. Your inheritance is kept in heaven for you. And you, by God's power, are kept through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. It's not now, but it's coming. And that inheritance is better than anything you have on earth. It doesn't fade. It doesn't go away. It's also a better family in Matthew 12, when his mother and brothers came looking for him while he was teaching. You know, they should have been inside listening to him teaching, but that's not what they valued. Not at that time. He responded before everybody in the 49th and 50th verses of Matthew 12 stretching his hand out to those who are around, saying, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother, sister, and mother. So, you know, however good your dad is, however fine your family is and your family name is, it's not like God the Father who is in heaven. Having the Father in heaven be the head of that house is the greatest thing. Whoever does the will of the father of Jesus in heaven becomes Jesus's brother, sister, and mother. That's, that's quite a, that's quite a, a promotion to move up from being just somebody, not nobody, but being somebody's family to being a brother, a sister, you know, um, a mother, you know, for the Lord. That's, quite a promotion. 
heaven also has a better master. Um, here on earth, you know, and master is maybe um, uh, an overly charged term in our country. What we mean by this is bosses, employers, those who have authority over others who work for them. But in heaven, we have, you know, a boss, a master, somebody who knows how to be reasonable, right? Ephesians 6, 9 says, masters, stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both your master and theirs is in heaven, and there's no partiality with him. So all of us, well, maybe not all of us, but <laughs> eventually we all come to have a job and to have bosses. And you have worked for some who are threatening. You have worked for some who show partiality, some who are unreasonable, right? Colossians 4.1 says, treat your bond servants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a boss in heaven. Yeah, sometimes you work for people who are not, you work for people who are not very nice and who are not just and who are not fair. But that's not the way it is with God. Our boss in heaven, our master in heaven, is better than whatever there is in this world. Even if your boss is great, he's still not God. <laughs> our citizenship is better, Philippians 3, 20 to 21. Our citizenship is in heaven. It's true. We have, um, of course, our own national citizenship, and nobody is saying that you renounce that or have no obligation to that. On the contrary, you fulfill those things as a Christian. What we're saying is you also know, though, that really there's something that is a higher calling still, that your primary affiliation is with heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven. From it, we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body. See, that's very consistent with what the other one said, that right now we don't know what we will be like. We know that when he comes, we'll be like him because we'll see him as he is, right? Or as Paul said, we'll all be changed. We may not all sleep, but we'll all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. We await from heaven the Savior who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious one by the power that enables him even to subject, subject everything to himself. But he is the great king who comes from heaven. We have a better citizenship a better promise, a better hope, a transformation when we are looking at heaven. You also have a better name. And, you know, the Proverbs say a name, a good name is more to be desired than much gold or than a good ointment. Uh, true. It is important. And not from the standpoint of having, um, you know, branding or history. He means your reputation, what you are known for. How are you named? How are you called? Do not rejoice in this, Jesus told the apostles when they came back in Luke 10, 20. He gave them the authority to cast out demons, to work miracles, and they were able to do so, and they came back rejoicing. But he said, don't rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you. Rejoice, rather, that your names are written in heaven. And, you know, that's pretty cool. If you think about it, that <laughs> when you are working for God, when you are living for God, your name is written in heaven. God knows who you are. Um, you know, this is the this is what it's about from heaven's perspective. These are the names that are known to God, those who obey him, those who serve him in his church. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. You know, uh, Hebrews says the same thing in a different way, where in the 12th chapter, um, you know, the apostle is comparing the old covenant, the old Sinai, its uh, priesthood, its offerings to the new covenant in Christ Jesus. And he says, you have come to the assembly, which is the church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. Everybody, everybody who names the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's what the scripture tells us. And we know, therefore, that your name is written in heaven when you obey the gospel. You are enrolled. You were part of that church. It said in Acts 2 that the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. 
So when you are being saved, as Peter himself said, save yourselves from this perverse generation. And those who received his word were baptized. You also are being enrolled. You're becoming a part of the assembly. Your name is written in heaven. So when you come to that obedience, you've come to the assembly of the firstborn. You've come to God, the judge of all, the spirits of the righteous made perfect. It's what God, it's what it's all about. There's not a better name than this. What else is in heaven? Well, there's other things um, somewhat intangible, but look, we talk about them. We have joy, we have unity, we have hope. First, I would point out in Luke 15, 7, Jesus said, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. <clears throat> And that one gets you thinking, at least I think it does, how different that is from this world. <laughs> it's one thing to talk about, oh, something else is coming and we don't know what that's like. This, we know what it's like. When somebody obeys the gospel and they, and they are saying, look, I'm not going to do this anymore. And people around them come to realize that this person is completely changed. The reaction is seldom the one you read about in Luke 15, 7. In heaven, there's great joy. More joy over the one person who changes his life or her life than there is over the 99 who have done so already and are remaining faithful. There's great joy because of that. Whereas in the world, sometimes people are mad about it. Like, what do you mean you're not going to go with us anymore? What do you mean you're not going to come to this place or you're not going to engage in this anymore? Or, you know, why do you think you're so much better than me? Or why do you think you know more than me? You know, people get mad about things. And you realize immediately, well, that's because this is earth and that is heaven. That's what heaven is like. In heaven, when people do right, that's a reason for rejoicing, especially when people turn from a life of wrong. That's an extra special reason for rejoicing. That's pretty different from earth when you think about it. And uh, granted, that's a little bit of an intangible, but, but it's true. That's as close as we get as, a, as an explanation of what it's like. In um, Ephesians 1, we have a unity that is being brought about it says in him, in verse 7, we have redemption through his blood. And that brings about a lot of things, but one of those things is that 10th verse. It is the plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him. Things in heaven, things on earth. Well, that's got to be us. We're on earth. We know that flesh and blood does not inherit the imperishable. We're the ones whose lives accord with the Spirit. And, you know, if you think back um, oops, at Luke 15, 7, there is sometimes joy over somebody who repents, right? It's in the churches, in the churches of Christ. When somebody obeys the gospel, we are joyful about that. We are glad for that, right? When somebody comes forward and is restored, that's a time of rejoicing. That's why this is called the kingdom of heaven. It's a little bit of heaven. It's come down out of heaven, the bride adorned for her husband. It's glimpses of what heaven is like. It's also what Jesus said, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That means you and me obeying him. So also, we are united in him by redemption through his blood, but united in him. Things in heaven, things on earth, insofar as we live right, we live for him. There's also in heaven a hope, Colossians 1, 3 and 5. The apostle said in verse 3, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. One of the reasons for which they give thanks is the fifth verse, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. We talked earlier about an inheritance that is being kept for you in heaven. Here we have a hope laid up in 
heaven. There is a reason. And you may recall when we read um, in Thessalonians that he said, we don't want you to despair as others who have no hope. But we do have a hope. Though we may lose this life, uh, uh, may lose this body, uh, you know, as is the normal way of the world, there is a hope. There is a resurrection coming. There is a reason to live right. And that hope does not disappoint. God is not ashamed to be called our Father. The other thing that's in heaven, as the scripture tells us, is the Son of God. So get looking with me at Hebrews 8. First thing would be we have a high priest. We have somebody there who makes an offering, somebody there who works on our behalf, who advocates for us, <coughs> who intercedes with God. Hebrews 8 said the whole point of the letter thus far is this. We have a high priest like Jesus, one who's seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. The whole reason he's writing and comparing the old to the new is because we have the new. It's real. And that's real, real. As in chapter 9, 24 of Hebrews, Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the real things. Christ has entered into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. He's actually there in heaven on our behalf, appearing before God, entering as a high priest into the real holy places, the real heaven. Not a foreshadow or a type of what's coming, but the real thing, Jesus is there on our behalf. That's in heaven. The Jesus that we knew in the flesh who walked among us is in heaven. Luke 24, Luke captures what happened at the end of his earthly work. At verse 51, while he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven, which is expanded a little bit. Luke expands it in Acts 1, verses 10 and 11. While they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Which is also what we read in Thessalonians there. The trumpet would sound and Christ would come in the clouds of the air. The dead would rise first, imperishable, and we would be transformed into imperishable and join him and be together with them in the air. That is in the sky, in the heaven is what that says. But we want to make note, finally, that he's not just in heaven, he's not just the high priest, but he is at the right hand of God. He is the power of God. He has God's approval in everything. He cares about you and me. Right? Mark 16, 19 said, the Lord Jesus, having spoken to them, was taken up into heaven and also sat down at the right hand of God. That means he's the power. He's the big. In Acts 7, when Stephen was being killed, he looked, full of the Holy Spirit, verse 15, into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Now, we read earlier that he was seated at the right hand of God. That is true, but he stands up because his servant, uh, Stephen, is about to be killed. And that matters to him. Um, that's telling you something about the heart of our Lord Jesus, which is very touching, but a very important thing. He takes it seriously. And in 1 Peter 3, 21 and 22, baptism, which corresponds to Noah's Ark, now saves you the way that Noah's Ark saved them through water. It does so not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience. And it gets its power, baptism does, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God and has angels, authorities, and powers subject to him. He is the one who is on high. He is the great power. But salvation comes through his uh, resurrection. 
Baptism gets its power through his death, burial, resurrection. As you're putting to death the old person, burying them in baptism, resurrected a new person in Christ Jesus. And in the final, final analysis, Acts 4.12, there is salvation in no one else. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. The only way to heaven is through Jesus. The only salvation there is, there's no other name, there's no other authority. All authority is given to him in heaven and on earth. So these are the things that we know about for heaven. On the one hand, it's hard to explain what is that like or how is, you know, what is existence in a spirit with no body? That's pretty hard to explain. And uh, you and I are in the flesh. <clears throat> uh, sometimes they call that uh, the frame, that you can't step out of your own frame and see the big, you know, see the whole picture. <laughs> and I think that's probably true. Uh, certainly people have drawn a lot of conclusions that they don't need to draw um, by means of technical advancements, technological tools of the trades, of the sciences and other things that have, you know, drawn conclusions that are not necessary conclusions. And this might occur to you if you realized that the eye you are using to look through the glass at the thing under the glass um, is made out of dirt and that the glass is also made out of dirt and the thing that you're looking at under the glass is also made out of dirt. <laughs> and maybe if you thought about that a little bit more, you wouldn't allow yourself to draw spiritual conclusions from the dirt. <laughs> I would give that advice as well. Maybe that's beneficial. But without knowing that, we still understand that heaven is where our hope is. Heaven is where our treasure is. In the same way that it doesn't have, we don't have that body, we have nonetheless um, these great blessings in him that are better than the blessings that we know on earth that are worth whatever we pay for it on earth because it's eternal they don't die anymore they live forever that outweighs anything that we pay for it here so today if you are not a christian become a christian be saved before it is too late we've already talked about these things through the scriptures we have read if you need to be baptized, let, let that be known. But today, if you are a Christian who has not lived right, repent, make things right before God. Let us help you with our prayers on your behalf, that we may be encouraged and uplifted, and that there may be rejoicing here, a little piece of heaven, if you will. If you need our prayers and need to be baptized, let it be known by coming to the front while we stand and sing the song selected.